Los Angeles uh, and the region. My name is Mike Lenz. I'm Associate uh, Professor of Urban Planning and Public Policy and Associate Faculty Director of the Lewis Center for Regional Policy Studies, all here uh, at the Luskin School of Public Affairs. I want to welcome you all to the Luskin School, um, and uh, I also want to thank the Lewis Center, uh, the Institute for Inequality and Democracy, as well as the Zyman Center for Real Estate uh, for sponsoring this event, uh, which is part of our um, our ongoing series, uh, newly named, but I would say still ongoing series, on uh, housing equity and community. Uh, that, so we look for future talks in future quarters um, coming up. So joining me today are some really wonderful panelists that we're very lucky to have here today. Um, and I'll go my left uh, to my right. Um, to, uh, Suzette Shaw is a Skid Row resident and activist. She's also a poet and active in several health and women's organizations in Los Angeles. Uh, Jerry Ramirez, to her right, it works on the Homeless Initiative in the office of the Chief Executive uh, of the County of Los Angeles. He's also a proud Bruin, I feel I should mention. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Then uh, to Jerry's right is uh, Dora Gallo uh, from, she's the CEO of a community of friends, which is uh, one of the premier providers of permanent supportive housing in uh, Los Angeles. Uh, and then finally, uh, last but not least, is uh, Jordan Vega, who is a current, and I assume proud, Bruin. <laughs> um, and he is the Director of Resources for Students for Students, which some may know as uh, Bruin Shelter, which is a student-run shelter for students experiencing homelessness. That's awesome. Um, so uh, I'm very, very impressed to see uh, Jordan here and to, think, and to hear about the, the great work that he is doing um, as an undergraduate in this, in this uh, university. Um, so please join me in welcoming our panelists today. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I want to just say a couple of more things to kind of frame our discussion on homelessness today. Uh, then we'll, I'll go straight to the actual experts. Um, I'm only kind of tangentially related to expertise in homelessness, I would say, to be honest. Um, so I think many of us are familiar with the fact that homelessness is very much on the rise in uh, Los Angeles County. Uh, in January 2017, uh, volunteers counted uh, over 58,000 people experiencing homelessness across LA County, which was a 23% rise from the previous year. Uh, in the city of Los Angeles proper, around 34,000 people were counted. Of those, uh, you know, 25,000 were living unsheltered, and of those, nearly 11,000 were defined as being chronically homeless. Um, so these are very large numbers historically, and they're large numbers uh, for, for any city, even of the size of Los Angeles. To an extent, uh, I would say we know what to do for people experiencing homelessness. Um, you know, give them housing with low barriers to entry um, and provide supportive services to keep them there. Uh, however, we've often been reluctant to fund uh, such housing or such programs and services. Right. Enter the voters of the city and the county of Los Angeles. One year ago, 77% of voters in the city of Los Angeles voted uh, or supported Proposition HHH. Uh, this provides $1.2 billion for supportive housing um, through a bond financed by increasing property taxes. Then in March of this year, uh, nearly 70% of voters in the city of Los Angeles uh, approved a quarter cent sales tax to fund uh, to raise an estimated $355 million each year uh, for homeless services and rental uh, housing subsidies over the next 10 years. Uh, Measure H is also a key source of operating funding for supportive housing. This is all fantastic news and we should celebrate this and, and we should uh, be proud of, of, of voters for, for making this move and making these sacrifices um, to instead. But money is not everything, and today we're going to talk about some of the challenges ahead, as, as well as uh, some early, sign, uh, early signs of, of success, I hope. Um, 
And we also uh, uh, will discuss our, what our newfound commitment to reducing homelessness means on the ground in people's lives. Um, so uh, I'm going to sit down now, um, <laughs> join my friends over here. And uh, you know, I want to first, uh, I want to continue with kind of this broad policy overview. And so I'll, I'll first go to Jerry. Um, and, and Jerry, if you could uh, please <coughs> fill in some of the gaps in this broad overview that I gave and um, you know, talk specifically about the county's efforts thus sure. far and where your office is trying to take us. Sure. Um, just wanted to point out that the Measure H, which was voted on by, mm -hmm. um, in, in March of this past year, it was voted by um, all uh, residents of the entire county of Los Angeles, not only the city of LA. So uh, those funds, which is uh, estimated to be about $355 million a year, is for the entire county. So I think that's very important. Uh, the city of LA has done a great job at um, combating homelessness. Uh, they've been very proactive. Um, Santa Monica, Pomona, other cities around the, the county. Um, as far as our concern, it's, I think it's a regional issue. And so there needs to be a regional approach. So what we're doing here at the County of Los Angeles is that uh, a couple years ago, uh, our Board of Supervisors uh, initiated what we call the Homeless Initiative. And so this Homeless Initiative, uh, our first task was to uh, develop a set of recommendations uh, that comprehensively deals with the issue. So over a six month period, a team of uh, county people working along with business, uh, philanthropy, uh, you know, faith-based communities um, developed a set of 47 strategies. It's really a comprehensive set of strategies on how to really combat homelessness. And these are proven strategies. And uh, we really relied on the expertise of the people who've been doing this work for many years. And so, um, just like the professor explained, um, there is triple H and H, and people always ask, like, how do they intersect? And so the $1.2 billion from Proposition Triple H is really kind of the construction of permanent supportive housing. And I believe uh, uh, up to 20% could be for affordable housing. And so where, where Measure H comes in is that it really kind of complements the permanent supportive housing because there's millions of dollars that are targeted to provide the services. Half the challenge is getting a, a, a home for a homeless person. Then the hard work begins in keeping them there. So it's very complimentary. We're working closely with the city of LA. We're working with business, United Way, the Hilton Foundation. And it's, it's a lot of work and it's very complex and we're just beginning. So I'll just start off with that. And if you have a, additional questions, I can answer those. No, thank you for that, uh, Jerry. Um, so I guess, you know, I kind of want to go from the, the broadest, you know, 10,000 foot level and, and narrow in from there. So uh, if I can move to Dora, um, from the standpoint of a supportive housing provider, um, you know, how's the work, how is your work changing as a, as a result? Um, and, and how do you situate yourselves within this, this policy framework? So um, uh, my organization, the Community of Friends, we're a nonprofit that was founded very interestingly um, with initial seed funding from the LA County Department of Mental Health. A lot of people don't know that about our organization. Um, 30 years ago, the Department of Mental Health um, was working with people on the streets who had uh, demonstrated mental illness, but after initial contact, they couldn't find them again. And, and realized that homelessness was a big issue. This is the late 80s. You know, this is an area of deinstitutionalization and they went around to see if there were organizations that provided um, housing for people who have experienced mental illness and, and came up really short. There were shelters in existence at the time and some transitional housing and even early, you know, renderings of boarding care. But there was really no housing provider out there providing the housing that was needed that was affordable and um, would be willing to house people with disabilities, particularly those that were of a mental health nature. So they provided seed funding to start an organization. We, our name came about because we, um, the initial founders wanted to create a community where people felt like they were among friends. So unlike other organizations that have the CDC behind them, we don't have that. Um, we are a housing development organization. First and foremost, our focus is to build what's now called permanent supportive housing, but 30 years ago there was no name for it. We had some very specific um, 
values of the organization with, with our six founders. One was that we would build permanent housing. Not that people couldn't leave, you know, it was essentially time limited. <laughs> that you didn't have to leave if you didn't want to. If, and so we thought we'll do, do apartment buildings where everyone had a lease, that we would have services in all of our buildings, and that we would do this outside of Skid Row. So our first buildings were in Hollywood, and then we expanded throughout the rest of the city of Los Angeles and into the county and to other jurisdictions. Um, but at the time, it was just an aff affordable apartment that, and when I say affordable, we were utilizing existing programs at the time to enable our tenants to pay 30% of their income from rent. And so we were, uh, there are now specific programs for that, but we were kind of contorting ourselves to make our programs fit with the existing funding sources at the time. So there were apartment buildings, they all had essentially some sort of rental subsidies tied to it. So when you came into the building, you didn't have to worry about how you're gonna pay your rent. If you qualified, and qualifications based on homelessness and mental health diagnosis, once you qualify, you automatically pay 30% of your rent, of your income for rent. So what, we had tenants paying you know, $26 at the time or $56 to as much as you know, four or $500 depending on, on, their, um, on their resources. Um, so affordable, and we had services. At the time when we started, we didn't want to um, recreate the wheel because we knew there were a lot of service providers out there, even in the, in the late 80s. Our role was to develop and that we would partner with community-based organizations to come in and provide the services. So right from the very beginning, our apartments had the community rooms, we had the offices for the case managers, and we essentially gave it for free for any social service agency who wanted to work with us. We gave them keys to our building, they came in, and they provided the services to the tenants in our building. Um, and since that model was created, now it's called permanent support housing, uh, which we you know, happily to adopt because there's now a name for it. Um, and our organization has expanded. We realize that we can't just purely be developers for people with special needs without really understanding um, the needs of the people living in the building. So our organization now has a, a very large services department. And even though we call ourselves a developer, we uh, our services department is the largest <laughs> department in our organization. And, and even then, we don't provide services now in our buildings, and I'll, um, I'll explain that in a second. Um, we also do the asset management and the property management, or we partner with, or we hire third-party property management companies. And in our 30 years now, we will hit 30 years next year, uh, we have completed 47 apartment buildings, five that are still in a portfolio, um, throughout Los Angeles County, into Orange County, and we're now doing projects in the Inland Empire, and we're a finalist for a uh, site in the Ventura County. So we've pretty much expanded our work. And because of that, and because primarily we are still a housing developer, first and foremost, um, we have service, we provide services in about 18 of our buildings, and the rest we continue to partner with community organizations. If we're coming into a new community, we don't want to you know, start something new. We want to establish partnerships um, and create opportunities to work together with other organizations. And so we right now work with probably about 20 different social service agencies, again, providing the free space, the free furniture, the computers for them to come in and do services for the tenants in our building. And, and we're thrilled now with all the attention focused on homelessness. Obviously, it would be great if there was no homelessness, but the fact that people are paying attention and have voted into resources, that's made our job in some ways a little easier. I mentioned early on, you know, there, were no, there was no HUD programs for homeless services. There was no rental subsidies, no services. You know, none of the federal departments or even local departments were really paying attention to it. So we had to, we had to understand the rules so we can work within the rules and bend the rules when we needed to, to, to really fund our program. And so we're thrilled to have the voters agree that this is an important issue mm -hmm. so that now we have um, construction sources, do development, as well as a service piece to provide the services in our buildings. Um, so if I can just s stick with, with the two of you, um, Jerry and Dora, real quick, and then, and, and then move to our other panelists. So can you give us a sense on <coughs> where we are in the timeline, right? Like where, you know, um, so much of this money is new, so much of, you know, this, this uh, these are things that were obviously just voted on in the last year, um, you know, so things are pretty early, right? So what, what where are we? Well, like you mentioned, it's, it's, it's really early. I mean, um, the Measure H funding, um, was um, available July 1st of this year. And um, so we're spending that now. There's 21 strategies, county strategies that we have, that the board adopted where, um, where that 355 million is being used. 
will be used. And so um, we went through a very public process to allocate that $355 million to those 21 strategies, and we're going to continue to do that throughout the you know, future years. As far as where we're at, um, one, of the, one of the biggest issues is when you do get this large infusion of money is that you, know, you have proven strategies, but also comes the growing challenges. Yeah. Um, not only within the county organization, <laughs> but also within the service provider communication uh, community, um, you know, they're trying to ramp up, and that takes time, and so that takes time, and that takes people, and that t takes expertise, and so within the next few years, there's going to be a lot of opportunities, not for only for employment at these organizations, but also for the creation of new organizations, and so a big significant challenge in that is also housing, permanent supportive housing. You know, um, the Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority estimated there's a, a gap of about 15,000 permanent supportive housing units in LA County. And so with the, with the Triple H funds and with state funds that are coming in, um, there's an opportunity to, a great opportunity to build these units. And that, that's one of the things I believe is realistic in the next 10 years is to, is to build those 15,000 units. The biggest challenge that I see is actually finding the sites to build those units, mm. especially in LA County, where you know rents are so high, land is high, and so uh, we're working on that issue as well. Mm -hmm. And you know, Dora can probably speak on the challenges. I know you've had some recent challenges on on um, you know getting approvals and, and actually you know building these units. And so that's that's what we're working on with our business part, or not business partners, but with the business community with the nonprofit community, um, you know, philanthropy on kind of coming up with strategies on how to deal with that issue of siting and I guess the general overall perception of homelessness, you know, because you mentioned 58,000 homeless and, you know, in the, the latest count, but that was in January when it's cold and probably a little rainy, right? But I know that the loss estimates that there's probably three to four times more people who fall in homelessness in and out of homelessness throughout the year right. and so the perception of who are homeless are there's people on the verge of homelessness so I know there's we have a, a strategy two strategies for homeless prevention and that's something that we're trying to ramp up so there's a lot of issues that we're dealing with right now so we're on the timeline we're in the beginning but we're moving fast and like you mentioned earlier the political will is here the political will is really important. Our board of supervisors, all five members, uh, you know, are on board. The city of LA is on board. We're currently working with the uh, 87 other cities in the county to get them involved in partnerships pro by providing planning grants and, uh, and technical assistance. So because of that political will and, um, you know, partners like Dora and other housing developers and service providers, um, we're trying to be very inclusive in this process because you know the county cannot do it alone um, you know housing developers can't do it alone um, so um, that is that is our premise and what we do in the county is we're trying to be inclusive collaborative and uh, transparent in our process yeah can I, and I, I was just actually uh, at a, um, a regional homeless advisory council meeting this morning right before, right before I came here so um, several notice of funding availabilities, you know, for us, um, so language or in the RFQs, requests for qualifications, as well as requests for proposals have been issued mm -hmm. used with HHH funds. About 10 of them have come out, and awards have been made to nonprofit organizations as well as different government agencies. And right now, the NOFA that's out is for bridge housing. It's also, there's also a NOFA out for domestic violence uh, shelters and transitional housing. Um, and the meeting I was at, they were talking about two other, RF one for legal services, so organizations that are uh, providing legal assistance to people who are homeless. Um, so every month they're rolling out two or three um, re uh, RFQs or R uh, NOFAs at a time. And then the other thing they made a comment on in talk about employment is they, this, the LASA, the Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority, expects to hire 100 people in the next e year to year and a half. And they estimate that the nonprofit organizations that will be um, applying for these funds, 
we'll be as we'll be hiring close to 700 new employees in the next 18 months and so that's a huge ramp up but also you know for people who are in those particular fields who are interested there's job opportunities <laughs> available um, both in in the case management social work as well as housing development um, and other types of um, a job opportunities related to this so if you're interested in it it's something definitely there's funding for it now um, and on the housing front, if I can make, I can say that on the HHH, the city funded their first, I think, uh, six projects last fall. The bonds have been issued, so about 400 pro units are moving towards construction. And then they also approved another six rounds. We were in that second round uh, of projects, and, and hopefully we will be in construction by June. Uh, so the housing is coming out as well. Mm -hmm. Um, so I wanted to uh, move to uh, or Suzette and Jordan to give their story a little bit. So uh, Suzette, can you just you know, tell us a, a little bit about uh, your uh, your experience um, and you know what you know, how how you see you, where you live um, uh, relating to some of these policy processes? Yeah. So. I am a Skid Row resident, um, and Skid Row in downtown LA houses the highest homeless population in the United States of America. So, on any given day, um, you know, there's um, thousands of people that are um, are uh, living um, living on the streets, and then we have, you know, a great deal of people who are housed and um, who are then living um, below. Um, below basically the what's considered you know like your standard rate of living um, and as far as getting by and living in subsidized um, housing situations um, that have been talked about here so um, some of the um, intersections of um, of the work being done is um, we have the varying degrees of um, how people are ending up homeless and some of the situations that are continuing to keep the same demographic of people um, displaced and, 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 and paralyzed to a certain extent of uh, why um, they're um, not able to really move forward in their lives. And so these are some of the cultural competency ills that we really have to intersect and take into account as far as when we are, um, now that we have the dollars, that we are intentionally allocating them so that we are being very proactive and intentional with um, you know, allocating those funds to organizations and to individuals who will um, um, be, very, um, be very tender with delivering those dollars and making sure that you know, those dollars are penetrating to the needs of the people. And um, I will say that you know um, I am um, I am a uh, board member with um, overseeing Measure H dollars, so I'm probably the only person with lived experience who actually sits on the um, LACLC board, the Los Angeles Continuum of Care board through LASA, overseeing Measure H dollars. Um, and so you know, like it's been said here, you know, there's going to be approximately 355 million dollars allocated towards um, housing and resources for. Um, for disenfranchised folks, and this will be over like like the next ten years uh, that that those monies will be allocated. Um, so one thing in like in, as far as in Skid Row area, you know, um, um, for instance, in 2015, um, LAPD spent 100 million dollars penalizing, criminalizing, and policing people simply because they had nowhere to go. So this is how when I talk about being intentional as far as how we're allocating those dollars and what we're doing to penetrate that those dollars are actually being allocated and, and spent directly on the needs of the people rather than penalizing them for not having any place to go, to go but then making sure that we're intentionally setting aside um, housing and we're using the housing first model um, and, and getting people housed first because I myself was housed just over a year ago myself and um, with my Section 8 voucher and so um, I had that Section 8 voucher for approximately nine months before I actually got housed so I was I had gotten every extension possible and I was in the process of losing my Section 8 voucher now I had housing specialists I had case manager, I had social workers, um, I had everyone, I volunteered all over. Um, but when it came to getting me housed, I was pretty much out there on my own. And, and you're talking to someone who, you know, I come with a social services background, I'm a Skid Row resident now, but I come with a social services background. Um, 
Um, and I come with some education and so forth, but I just, I, I really, I really lay that out because just think in terms of folks who are displaced and don't necessarily, you know, have my loud voice and, and really get on people's nerves and really know how to really be intentional about, you know, speaking up for their rights and, um, no, you will not throw me out on the streets. No, you, you know, no, I do deserve to be housed. Yes, I have been a taxpayer and yes, I may be poor and I may live, you know, on the brinks now, but, you know, I do deserve housing and housing should be a human right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jordan, can you tell us uh, a little bit about uh, Students for Students and, um, you know, how, you know, you are connected to other agencies and, and, and homelessness providers in the, in the city and county? Sure. Um, so I guess I'll introduce myself a little. I'm Jordan. Um, I was first uh, exposed to homelessness when my best friend, when I was around 12 years old, experienced homelessness for a brief period of time. It was a situation where her parents told my parents and my parents relayed the info to me and um, she didn't know that I knew. So being 12 years old and not really knowing what to do, I felt like I was, I felt like I wasn't really able in a position to help and give back and now that I'm in college, um, I heard of Students for Students and Bruin Shelter my freshman year of college and um, I knew instantly that I wanted to devote my time and effort towards this cause. Um, Students for Students was founded by Lewis. Um, Lewis was a graduate student at the time when he experienced homelessness and he decided to start an organization to house homeless students because um, Bruin Shelter is actually the first um, homeless shelter in the nation that houses students and it's student run as well. So that's why it's called Students for Students. And the structure of our nonprofit is Students for Students is a nonprofit and Bruin Shelter is kind of like the subsidiary, um, the student run group that operates the shelter. So Students for Students gives the resources to Bruin Shelter mm -hmm. who runs the nonprofit. Um, so a resident would typically go in at 7 p.m. to our shelter, which is based in Santa Monica. Um, along with two supervisors who kind of act like RAs in a sense and their students as well um, and then two volunteers also students grad students or undergrads who cook meals for everyone at the shelter that night and um, we cook meals we eat dinner at a circular table all residents and staff and then we talk about our day talk about school because that's the thing that we all have in common we're trying to reach a college degree so um, and last year was our first season we housed around six residents. Um, our, our space is kind of small. We're in a building next to a church in Santa Monica. So um, we are currently under construction right now, hoping to expand so that we can accommodate more students. Um, along with the food, um, dinner, and breakfast for our residents and housing, um, we also provide our residents with case managers, case workers, who make sure that their mental health and medical needs are addressed. And right now we're in partnership with uh, Community Partners mm -hmm. as kind of our fiduciary and also um, local Santa Monica support. That's mm -hmm. awesome. Wonderful. Uh, so I guess, uh, Jerry, you brought this up um, and I was gonna get to it eventually, certainly, but let's dive in. Um, so, you know, I think we most, many of us are familiar with uh, resistance to housing in LA. Uh, and you know, people resist market rate housing in LA. People resist subsidized housing and, and uh, supportive housing everywhere. Um, you know, and uh, you alluded to some of the uh, challenges that a community of friends have had as well. So I think the two of you are pretty well uh, situated to, to tell us, like, you know, what is being done to kind of unlock the potential of neighborhoods to house people, house more people, to house particularly uh, people experiencing homelessness. Um, you know, what can be done? What is being done? Um, what are some of the, the challenges and successes that you see? Well, I can talk about uh, what we're doing now. Um, and this was an issue we've been thinking about for, you know, a couple years. And so we hired a consultant, communications consultant. Um, we've been working with them um, for I, I believe about seven or eight months um, to to really discuss about the messaging of a permanent supportive housing specifically. Mm -hmm. 
And so, you know, we're working with Fenton Communications and we're coming up with a messaging strategy or strategies on how to change the perception of permanent supportive housing. Um, we've had focus groups. Um, we've identified um, a few sites, or I think we identified a few sites where we're going to test these messages. Um, but it's really interesting because um, over the last year, I've when I since I've been involved more deeply into the housing the housing issues, uh, there's been some some um, instances where community um, engagement has happened towards the end of a development and killed the project. There was one in San Gabriel Valley um, for I believe 180 something units of permanent supportive housing for single adults and even for veterans, and um, and this is a project that was in development probably four to five years, three to four to five years, and uh, the local community got um, a hold of this information and they basically killed it. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we tried our best to kind of keep it alive. We were trying to throw money here and there, but it, it, just, it just died. And so I think this work that we have with Fenton Communications and really the messaging on, on trying to kind of change the perception of what permanent supportive housing is, what they look like, and how, you know, because there's always these arguments that, you know, they're criminals, crime's going to go up, you know, if it's near a school, they're going to do something to the children, um, there's drug use. Um, but, you know, a lot of these places that, they're, that, um, that the communities, you know, um, opposing these projects at, I mean, they're like motels, where there's drugs and prostitution and everything else there, and they'd rather have that than a permanent supportive housing unit where it's going to be controlled, there's going to be security, they look very nice. There was an, uh, I went to a focus group uh, a couple months ago and uh, you know, there was like I think 15 people in that focus group and I was behind the, the little window there and they asked a question like, uh, or they showed a picture of a permanent supportive housing unit, right? And they showed another picture of a, a regular apartment building or different pictures and they asked like, which one do you think is a permanent supportive housing, you know? And uh, they can really, you know, um, tell the difference. And then when they identified which one was the permanent supportive housing um, development, uh, one of the guys there goes, man, I drive by that building every day going to work. And I always thought, what a beautiful building. I wish I could live there. Mm -hmm. So, um, but then again, with that, there were also some members in that focus group saying like, hey, man, I pay taxes, I work, and my apartment's not as nice as that. So why should they have a nice apartment if they're not paying, you know, they're not contributing? So it's a very delicate and very, um, you know, very uh, complex issue. And so we're working throughout those issues to develop a message um, to change people's perceptions and also to kind of um, also come up with strategies on how to get people involved to support these projects. Because there's a lot of opposition but we need people to support them, <laughs> to take the time, even if it's not in your, even if it's in your neighborhood, to yeah. support them. Yeah. And that's kind of the thing that we need to do, and that's what we're working with our different partners to, to really kind of um, get that message out, mm -hmm. and you know, get that structure to where we can get a hundred people at a meeting and say, hey, we need this project here. Yeah. And all neighborhoods throughout LA County need to, um, you know, contribute. Yeah. 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 Go please. Uh -huh. Thank you. See, this is precisely why I um, I put myself out there to um, talk about the other face of poverty, the other face of homelessness, as well as um, all the, that which intersects with it. Because people tend to stereotype and sensationalize what poverty looks like, and yet um, probably many of us sitting in this room have, if if we're if we haven't come from you know that somewhere in our background we have family or friends that have and um, you know um, and this is another reason why I talk about the fact that Skid Row um, you know the demographic is primarily uh, black folks so black women for instance are the number one demographic middle-aged elderly medium age is 51 not just year after year but decade after decade but then um, let's talk about the intersection of the fact of you know African, make, or African Americans make up 9% of the population here in LA yet 40% are living in uh, poverty uh, to homelessness so these are the intersections that you know we as a people that we have to get real about being real about who we are and when we talk about nimbyism um, 
you know, um, when we're saying, well, not in my backyard yet, you know, people are either going to live on the sidewalk next to you or else you're going to make a space for them in the, um, in the building next to you. This is why we as a people have to get real about being real. Thank you. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think, I think there's a huge disconnect between what people think and what the reality is, both from the perception of who they think are the people who are homeless and who they think are the people with uh, mental health diagnosis. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I remember it's, it's, you know, the comment you made, you know, I can't, I can't even tell you how many uh, community meetings I've been involved in where people say the, the darndest things, you know, and, <laughs> and you have to sit there, uh, you know, control your, your emotions and your anger. Um, and I think, um, but I think it's important to have, continue to have those conversations. I do those meetings over and over again. There were, and some of the more progressive neighborhoods, you would be surprised. It's no different. Yeah, yeah. You know, put them in Lancaster, <laughs> you know. You, you know, what about our children when I'm doing a family building and I'm trying to give the children who have been experienced homelessness, living in a car and a shelter, a better life. And so you got to protect our children. And I, you know, what do you say to that, right? So, so there's this big disconnect. And the only way to get past it is to continue conversation, whether it's in a setting mm -hmm. like this or whether it's small group settings, whether it's in your neighborhood council, um, and, and not be fearful. I mean, there, it is hard sometimes to hear the things that people say, but I, I'm a firm believer is that you have, to, you have to say what you feel, hopefully in a constructive way, but you say what you feel in order to get it addressed. If someone is standing in front of me and keep talking about parking and density, when they're really afraid of the people moving in, I will never, ever address their concerns because they're not being honest about it. So people need to be honest about what are you doing from a services standpoint? Who are the people moving in? Can you tell me this? And sometimes I can't tell them because of confidentiality reasons or whatever. But I think we need to keep having these conversations. And once people understand, and if you yourself support it, then it's important to speak up, like Jerry was saying. Is that you, got, you have to join the forces. It's a lot easier, I know, to go home after a long day of school and or work, and you got kids, you got to cook dinner. But those neighborhood council meetings, oh boy, I tell you, in the evenings, that's where it happens. And I know, <laughs> I know about UCLA and what you guys are trying to do with your own neighborhood council and breaking apart. I've been reading about that too, and I think that's great. I think the issue needs to be highlighted. I think we need to all speak up. And I think that writing, if you can, send an email at 12 o'clock at midnight. Who cares? Send the email out to your elected officials. Send it to other people. Send it to the neighborhood council folks saying, I live here. You know. I, I've been involved in several NIMBY battles, including one going on right now, and both here and in the city of Redlands. And, um, and what is gratifying to me, my staff, is when we get an email from a neighbor, I live two blocks away from your site, I work, I can't come to your meetings, but keep up the fight, I support this project. And I, take, I say, can you please email that to the council member, please? <laughs> <laughs> you know? So we need people to speak up, and we need people to just um, be, be part of the conversation. Um, and I think that's the only way we can get projects cited. Because there is a concern that we have money available, and we're not going to be able to find the locations necessary to build the housing. So, um, so I think everyone needs to be a part of the conversation. Yeah, especially um, for homelessness, it's a prevalent issue here at UCLA too. Um, you'd be surprised by how many classmates might be going through homelessness. They're trying to sleep at Powell Library because it's 24 hours, or they're sleeping at a corner in Student Activity Center. So really thinking about not homeless people as, you know, separate people and strangers, but really fellow Bruins could be affected by this issue as well. Yeah. I'm going to say one other story too. and I. I'm looking at the camera knowing I'm being taped, but <laughs> mental health is another stigma, another stereotype. You know, we have to keep, you know, do we say special needs, mental disabilities, you know, I just, you know, mental illness is what it is. And I think people don't understand how prevalent it is. Depression is, is very common. And maybe people come in and out of the cycle of, of depression. You know, you may have it in your teens and then you, you grow out of it and in your 50s or 60s comes back. But I remember having a conversation with a family member and the family member was really, my family member, was very surprised I'm doing this work and such. And you know, what does it mean working people? And I looked at it and I said, you're on Prozac. What do you think? <laughs> you know, you also have depression. You know, people don't make that yes, connection. Yes, yes. And so it was, it was, yeah. uh, she looked at me and kind of did a double take. But you know, yeah. I think people just, there's a huge disconnect mm -hmm. all the way around. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. well. 
If I may say one other thing is um, also um, as you know, our city is um, allow allocating uh, dollars to um, these millionaire and zillionaire developers that are coming in to build. Uh, we need to be holding them accountable as far as um, that they should be um, making not just affordable but um, low income housing, um, setting aside um, units within the buildings that they're actually getting tax exempts for building within the, our communities. Um, I can remember over a year ago when I was uh, walking around with my Section 8 voucher and um, some folks coming to a um, community meeting in Skid Row, and it was um, developers um, and architects and so forth, and they, uh, they were pitching um, uh, um, a building that they were going to be uh, building um, in Skid Row, and they were looking for the buy-in of the community, these executive directors and so forth who run these missions and nonprofits. Um, of oh well, we we know that um, they they were very intentional about saying that we're going to be building these for people who work in downtown LA but can't afford the trendy loss, and these are the words that they actually used. And I'm sitting there and I'm steaming because I'm thinking. What in the world? And, and so they were saying that um, the people that are living out on the street, I mean on the sidewalk, outside of these buildings, uh, we need your help with uh, moving them, uh, displacing them. And um, we've already talked to LAPD, and so we know that we're going to have to hold some meetings for these folks. And on and on. I mean, they just get on and on. And, 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 and I kept raising my hand, and, and finally they let me speak. And I said, you know, I lived, I'm, I'm part of the debacle of the middle class. I lost job, lost home. I lived in Silicon Valley. I, I worked for large companies, small companies. I ran my own business. You know, I was that person who commuted from Sacramento into uh, Oakland and Sacramento into San Francisco, on and on and on, to um, on a daily basis for work. But see, this is what you're so so busy stereotyping who we are as a people living in Skid Row. You don't even see us as people, and we ended up displaced and through all the gentrification that we've gone through because we had no other place to go. Yet you want to come to the community which houses the highest homeless population in the United States of America and then you're going to push them out from their own community and, and rather than saying, well, well, whatever people come to live in this building, um, they need to understand that they'll, those are their neighbors and they need to live right next door to their neighbors. Um, and, and that's the thing that the part of the disconnect of, you know, you want to push people down and then put your foot on their throat and then blame them for being in their predicament um, while putting them in their predicament all at the same time. So I guess, can one of you speak to, and this, this may be best for Suzette, I don't know, um, kind of the, you know, Skid Row as, as a place and how that's evolved in recent years, um, particularly in the face of considerable redevelopment in, in downtown. Yeah. Yeah, so um, through the gentrification process, um, Skid Row has um, continued to be condensed. And, and you know, and only recently are we really talking about Skid Row as a community. And, um, you know, I was, I was, Traumatized. I'm not gonna lie. I was traumatized. I'd never heard of a place called Skid Row. I was at a women's safe house house prior to coming to Skid Row, and they would talk about at the dinner dinner table this place called Skid Row, and I was literally having nightmares. But you know, um, and and that's another story. But the thing is, is that um, with the condensing that continues to happen, is so people are being condensed and condensed into a smaller demographic um, while. Uh, the development continues to go on around us and the development will continue to go on around us and, and the development is coming is coming uh, closer and closer to within the community of Skid Row but at that same time you know we have people living in less than third world living conditions according to the United Nations standard by the way so like we have um, one of the issues that we're dealing with now is the fact of um, you know um, public toilets so there's approximately nine public toilets for all the hundreds of thousands of people living out on the streets on a daily basis so um, making, you know, holding the city and county uh, accountable as far as um, that is, that's, that's not only a public health hazard, those are humanitarian crises. I mean, according to United Nations standard, when, when, um, when, uh, when, um, 
when, when places are built in, 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 say, in Africa and so forth, for folks, they actually have standards that they actually allocate as far as making sure that there's a purse, a restroom, you know, that's allocated for per person. But, you know, we don't, here we are living in such a rich, vast, rich, vast community, yet we have the cognitive dissonance when it comes to our own people. So that, that is the outcry. So these are some of the issues that we have to fight on a daily basis with while we are trying to intersect the needs of housing, transitional housing, and just people's basic rights to live and rest. And, um, and the displacement of, you know, up-to-date Jim Crow ordinances and laws that, you know, to say, well, you know, you can, uh, you can only have a bag and you can't have, you know, you can't have larger than a bag and, and you can't have your tent up during this time of day and, and on and on and on. But at the same time, you know, we can run people around and that's really, I called it the monkey game when I was homeless. You know, I caught, you know, they, they, they put you out early in the day and then, you know, and, and, and you have to like know where to go. And I had no idea. I ended up here from Arizona. I literally had no idea. Uh, but I called the monkey game because you just have to run around, run around all day long with really no sense of like, what am I going to do? And these are the things, you know, um, poverty is trauma. Homelessness is trauma in and of itself. And then when we add all of these other dynamics, it's only further exacerbating people's mental state. So when we talk about mental health issues, it's not like, you know, people just sh like show up in a community called Skid Row and say, okay, I set my fork down here. I choose to be homeless. Or, oh, I choose to have mental health issues. No, we have women, women who are fleeing oftentimes domestic violence uh, situations who have no place to go and can't stay in that living environment that they're in um, and so they end up displaced to the streets then only them being further exacerbated through trauma because now they're having to uh, and they're in a flight of flight of having to of survival on the streets and this is a demographic uh, these are epidemics within our communities um, within Skid Row itself of you know, I'm a trauma survivor. Many of the women who have been displaced to Skid Row are trauma survivors. And then we have the other epidemics of, you know, women, uh, domestic violence, sex, sex trafficking, um, um, and, and all of these cultural competency ills that are surrounding people who are displaced and, and yet we're not really, uh, yet we have a cognitive dissonance as far as uh, who the people are. And, and, and so many of the folks that I've met, um, have been Ivy League graduates, were prior nurses and students and, and teachers and you know and, and myself I worked in social services so these are who we are as a people. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, no 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 I just I wanted to I wanted to kind of use some of that as uh, to, to break to you know send it back to um, you know, uh, Jerry or Dora in particular. Um, so you know there's a lot a lot of the focus um, you know of the funding and the, and the programming is on, you know, new construction, you know, new services. But we have, of course, one of the, um, you know, most famous, infamous, you know, whatever kind of you know, word you want to use, uh, and largest, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, traditionally thought of as homeless, you know, settlements or, or whatnot mm -hmm. in 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 America in Skid Row. Like, you know, how does <coughs> How does some of that money and policy affect, or what what what, what is this, the explicit commitment to affect, you know, what is already there uh, um, in, in the form of Skid Row, um, and kind of interact, you know, some of that programming with, with Skid Row. Well, there's there's current efforts now in Skid Row. I mean, there's this. Uh, it's not really funded by Measure Age, but it's I think it's called the C3 project in, in Skid Row where I think C3 is a uh, county, city, and community. Uh, they have a strategy to um, end street homeless, um, I believe in, I don't know, a few years, five, 10 years, I forget the, the exact details. But, um, and that's really through um, outreach. I know in Skid Row that um, the Department of Health Services and, and the Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority uh, went out and mental health. There was a team, teams that would go out on Wednesdays, I believe, in Skid Row to kind of engage uh, the homeless. I, I went with them one time. And so they would only go on Wednesdays, once a week. And, but they've been doing this for many years, and a lot of people who are working in these outreach teams, uh, they built relationships with, with the homeless, um, street homeless, uh, just by saying hi, you know, and knowing that they're there. Now, because of the C3 project, which is not uh, funded by Measure H, but they go out every day now. 
So their goal is to is to really take care of the street homeless when I think it's five years by dividing into four quad quadrants. And so that's a current effort that's happening. As far as with Measure H and all this, the funding, uh, yes, Skid Row is the highest concentration in LA County in, in the United States, um, but it's also popping up everywhere. There's, there's, there's huge pockets in um, South Central or, or, or you know South LA. There's huge pockets in the valley through uh, the riverbeds. Um, if you drive down Hollywood, almost every underpass, I mean, those aren't the things that you, you've seen, you've seen pop up in the last five years, yeah. you know? I live in Highland Park. Um, the last f four years or so, there was just like on the, Arroyo, I think there's just like, I think it's in Arroyo. The Arroyo, there were, there were people living in the Arroyo, building up their, their homes, you know? Um, they clear them out, they come back, um, they got no place to go. And there's always this perception that they're coming from somewhere else, you know? And there are people who come from other, you know, states and other parts of the, uh, uh, you know, of California. But for the most part, it's people who are from, from here. I had to deal with the city of Santa Clarita. I went to one of their council meetings to discuss homelessness. And there was a lot of community p people saying, well, you know, if we build a shelter, they're gonna come from other areas. <laughs> you know, if we, do, if we build permanent supportive housing, uh, the valley is just gonna ship them over here. You know, and so, but there were other community members who said, no, we do outreach on our own time because they're part of a church. And so these are people who grew up in Santa Clarita for the most part. Yeah, there's going to be people who come from other states and, you know, from other parts of the state. But for the most part, they're people, who, they're our neighbors. Yeah. And so we have to really con consider that. I mean, a lot of, there's a lot of focus on Skid Row. But, you know, with Measure H, because it is countywide, you know, our focus is to, um, service the entire county and also distribute the permanent supportive housing <coughs> units in all where it's needed not just concentrated in skid row not just concentrated in south la but on the west side where there's homeless in the valley where there's homeless in lancaster where there's homeless uh, that's our strategy it's a regional approach uh, knowing that skid row is still a, a major problem and issue and, and, and where there's efforts underway dealing with that but with this infusion of money, we're, truly, we're really trying to take a regional approach. Mm -hmm. but on, a, on the housing front, I mean, this is that brings up a good point, and you did too, is that um, Prop HHH funding is for new construction. It's not for renovate, it's not, well, it could be for renovation as long as you're bringing new apartments online to serve people who uh, have been homeless, who, and, you, and it was not previously used for that purpose. But from a preservation standpoint, that money cannot be used for that. So if you've got a lot of older buildings in the Skid Row community that have been housing low-income people or people who've experienced homeless homelessness, and they're 100-year-old buildings, 150-year-old buildings, you cannot use HHH funds to renovate those buildings so that they can stay affordable and livable for those people living there. And that is a concern that some community members, as well as affordable housing developers and renters have, have have a voice, um, and and I think you know when when we put push the effort to get that bond measure on, there was a lot of conversations in the affordable housing community about how that was going to be structured. You know, I think Jerry mentioned that the 1.2 billion over 10 years, 20 percent of it could be used for regular affordable housing, and or you know um, facilities that serve people who have experienced homelessness, things like showers and storage facilities. That was hard fought. When, when, when the council first discussed the bond measure, it was upwards of 50-50. And the folk, those of us who work in the homeless community says, no, we're not going to, you know, the crisis is homelessness. Yes, affordable housing is an issue, affordability is an issue, but we were seeing more and more encampments and tents. And, and if we were gonna make this big push and we're gonna ask the voters to vote for it, they're gonna wanna see results. They're gonna wanna see these, these tents and encampments gone. So, so we pushed it back and got an 80-20% split. But it was with the understanding that any other resources that come out um, uh, will go for what we call regular affordable housing. You know, families that don't have special needs, veterans that don't have special needs, you know, young adults with no special needs, seniors who don't necessarily have special needs. And so there's another battle right now on linkage fee, trying to keep, create more resources. And so the affordable housing community supported the permanent supportive housing bond measure with the understanding 
that when there's an opportunity to secure additional resources for both preservation or for new development of regular affordable housing, that those of us who pushed on the homeless side will join up, you know? And so like I just got several emails today saying, we gotta move the linkage policy out of the um, committees and onto council for a vote, and a bunch of homeless providers signed on to that. Even though we know that money that's being raised will not be used for uh, supportive housing. Um, because with an eye towards the whole preservation issue as well. Um, there, are, um, there are a lot of developers, market rate developers, who are purchasing these buildings and converting them and, um, and displacing traditionally low income people and people who experience homelessness and that's a concern and HHH doesn't fund for that. So we've got to continue to look for resources. I would hope that the voters don't think our job's done, we voted for this and it's going to be fine. Mm. LA is behind half a million uh, units of uh, affordable housing to meet all the needs. And we are building, you know, at a clip of 10,000 a year. And, you know, we are going faster now, but partly because the market is so hot. So I just got the building and safety report. They issued permits between July and September of this year. They issued 7,300 permits, uh, permits for 7,300 units. 95% of them are no market rate. So 405 units are for low-income folks. And when I say low-income folks, I'm talking about 60% and below. I'm not even talking about the people who are homeless. Yeah. So not fast enough and not enough. And so we need to continue to build. We need to continue to preserve, because we can't lose faster than we can build, right? Because that's fast. The whole condo conversion thing that happened several years ago, I mean, it's just, it's, everything is just decimating our affordable housing stock. So, um, so all the resources available, we're all in this together. Preservation is important, just as homelessness is important, because otherwise we'll never catch up. Mm -hmm. yeah, agreed. Uh, so I've asked a lot of questions, and I have many more, but I would <laughs> like to throw to the audience, um, you know, who I know has been waiting patiently to ask us just those things. I'll be in charge, I guess. Thank you guys for being here. Uh, quick question on the 80% split of, of uh, homelessness supporting and supporting services. What percentage of that goes to construction versus supporting services? And like, what's the optimal mix? How do you guys think about that? It's actually all, that 80% um, is all for construction. Uh, and the other 20% is for construction too. None of the funding can be for services. Even that 20% that I said can be used for facilities and showers and storage, it can only be used to build it. It won't be used to operate it. Yeah. So that's where some of the Measure Age funds come. Mm -hmm. So uh, on Friday, actually, we're going to um, sign a memorandum of, of understanding with the city of LA. For every unit of permanent supportive housing that they build for currently homeless uh, individuals and families, uh, the county will be committing the services through Measure Age. So that is our commitment, not only to the city of LA, but for anybody in LA County who wants to build a permanent supported housing unit, the, the county is committed to providing the wraparound services that are needed to um, assist the homeless individual and family <coughs> to stay and thrive in, in that unit. And where are they signing it? <laughs> I believe the mayor is signing it and uh, Mark Ridley Thomas, supervisor for the second Where? district. I don't know. At my building. Oh, are they really? <laughs> <laughs> oh. We have a grand opening uh, this Friday, and when we invited the electives, they all said, oh, let's do the signing at your building. And so awesome. Just yesterday, I got the email cool. saying, the mayor's going to MC, and I'm like, uh, you know, it's my grand opening. I need to be able to thank my funders, you know, so, yeah, so they, uh, it's, it's at a building in South LA, 100% uh, cool. homeless. Uh, formerly homeless veterans with uh, disabilities and so um, I would normally say come one come all but it's kind of be crowded <laughs> so, no, I could put yeah. a plug in real quick yeah. to, for home walk this Saturday yes, oh, it is. Yes. which yeah. is on sa Saturday at Grand Park I believe it like at seven o'clock in the morning mm -hmm. it's a walk for homelessness you brought on, um, it's a partnership between business and government and so it's you walk out you walk what two or three miles through mm -hmm. downtown LA um, it's a great walk, so if you can go, show up at Grand Park in downtown LA on Saturday morning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The lady over there. Um, in the back. Um, I wonder, a couple of you were talking about resistance from neighborhood organizations. <laughs> and to me, one of the most compelling things I learned when I did a research project on Housing First is how much less it costs us. Mm -hmm. If you don't even take into consideration any humanitarian issues, and 
for me, you know, a lot of people are, are interested in homelessness for humanitarian reasons and funding it, but for those who aren't, doesn't the dollar amount speak to somebody? Yeah, yes. it does. It does. <laughs> I mean, that seems it does. like an obvious way to say, listen, yeah. you're going to spend this money, you're going to spend more if we don't build this housing, That's true. if we don't offer these services. So let's not let's not even argue about whether or not we're going to do it. Let's argue about where we're going to do it and how we're going to solve it. Mm -hmm. Right. We have a program in the County of Cal Housing for Health um, from the Department of Health Services. And um, what they're doing is that they identify um, those individuals who are living in the street who use the emergency room as their, you know, primary care and wherever they get sick. And so they identify those people who, who are like, you know, it costs a lot of money every time you, you, you help somebody out in an emergency room. So they identify those people who use it two or three times a year and, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars later, you know, to assist them where it costs, I, I believe, like seventeen, eighteen thousand dollars $18,000 a year to house that person. And they'll have medical staff on. So they use some of their money that's already allocated f for their department at the, at the health services. And they, they house these people and these individuals and um, provide nurses and assistance, you know, year round. So they won't go to the emergency room. And we're saving a lot of money, a lot of taxpayer money. And so you're absolutely right. It's a lot less expensive to house um, uh, homeless individuals and families than to, you know, have uh, police uh, take their time, um, they'll go to the emergency room for their care, um, just all the issues that uh, result from people being homeless. It's a lot less expensive, absolutely. Different messages for different, you have to have different messages for different audiences, so it depends on who you're talking to, but that does resonate for some folks. Absolutely. I mean, I will also give another plug. I'm here to plug. Um, it's 47. We have actually there's 51 strategies now, but um, the county's website is homeless.lecounty.gov. There you will find detailed um, our detailed strategies, our 51 strategies. You will find um, um, information on all the meetings that we have. Um, everything you need to know that we're involved with in LA County with our partners is at um, homeless.lecounty.gov. Over in the corner. I just want to introduce, uh, we invited, I invited uh, a representative from United Way. Thank you for giving United Way a plug here <laughs> for Saturday's home walk, but I'll let Maddie uh, talk about this. We actually brought some flyers um, for a home walk. Thank you so much for giving a plug. We'll see you out there. Yeah, um, I'll be there. And there's a UCLA team, so um, just come see us at the end. We'll give out a flyer and tell you how to sign up for Saturday. There's a long connection between Luskin and Homewalk. We've, we've always had a team here. Yeah. Do the, any of the strategies that the county have uh, involve surplus lands of the various partners within the county? Yes. We, you know, one of the things that, you know, the county provides, you know, a lot of services to the entire region. But one of the least responsibilities we have or control over is land use, right? Um, uh, that's, that's kind of the, the realm within the cities. But um, we do have a strategy um, where we um, are going to use, you know, county property to build um, housing. I, I guess the challenge has been um, identifying those properties mm -hmm. and making sure that they're actually, you know, good sites. Because a lot of these county properties are sites that where it needs a lot of cleanup and, and yeah, and they're kind of out in the middle of nowhere. There's a, we have a lot of property in Lancaster. You know, but we're not going to build housing in the middle of nowhere. But we're also working, I know the city of LA has a similar strategy, and we're also trying to promote that with the um, other cities as well. Um, and we're trying to engage the other cities by providing them planning grants and um, to initially start. And that's one of the uh, requirements we're having is for them to look at uh, providing city owned property to build uh, not only uh, housing, but also. Um, you know some shelters in order to to meet the need of, of the of that area but yeah that is one of the strategies yeah, right here in front hi i'm alan toy i'm a rec and parks commissioner in santa monica and we have a, an enormous problem with people sleeping in the parks uh mm -hmm. during the day and my contention is that that's because we drive them away at night and so given that we're anywhere from a couple hundred thousand to half a million housing units down and we're building as fast as we can, but we're not keeping up. How do you folks feel about shelter first as opposed to, or not as opposed to, but 
in a part in of an it. interim interim mm -hmm. kind of thing that could then lead people to social services to uh, give them a safe place to be at night, um, mm -hmm. and so they can stop being <coughs> ghouls wandering around mm -hmm. all night long, being pushed from bench to bench, mm -hmm. and then are off during the day where they couldn't work anyway because right. they haven't slept on. Well, one of our strategies really is going towards um, ex enhancing the shelter system. Yeah, we don't think, you know, our goal is, is permanent support, permanent housing, not only permanent support, housing. But there's also a need for those people who are on the streets right now. So we want to build that structure. And so that stra our strategy is really not building just more daytime or nighttime shelters, but also 24 hour shelters. So we have funds allocated for the enhancement of shelters, for creating new shelters, but also for going for 24 hours. So that's what we want to do so that they can be engaged, like you mentioned. You know, they take off during the day and they're trying to figure out something to do. Uh, so that's one, that's one of our strategies. And Bruin Shells' goal is to transition our residents to permanent housing as well. So I feel like the synergy between permanent Absolutely. housing and shelters would yeah. be really good. Yeah. And I think that the moment is swinging back because there was a period of time where shelters were out of favor. They were not, they were being defunded essentially from both an operational standpoint and for new construction. And I think people are realizing that it takes a long time to build housing and it takes a long time even if you have a voucher to find market rate housing that would accept it. So, you know, I've always been a strong believer of a strong shelter system. Um, and I think people are starting to realize that. I think they're renaming it, though. Are they crisis housing, or there's, I don't know. Yeah, there's different names for it, but essentially it's a shelter. But they're trying to enhance it. I mean, I, mean, I think you mentioned that um, you, know, you know, a lot of people don't like to go to shelters because you can only take you know, a little bag. And if you have a pet, you can't take your pet. And um, so that we're trying to enhance the idea those of things. Shelter first is the same right. as housing first. Right. You don't have to leave your drug addict right. addictions or your right. pets or your belongings gotcha. outside. You come in because it's shelter first. Right. Mm. And I think that concept is so so important because we you're not going to solve the problem with building housing. Right. And if you, if you do, it's going to be 50 years or 100 years. No. And Hopefully so not. in the meantime, <laughs> we have tens of thousands of yeah. people every night on the streets, unsafe, yeah. in harm's way, getting battered, raped, robbed, whatever. And where does that humanity arise? Yeah. You know, that's where the and that's where the nimbyism arises too, because they're sleeping in my alley. Mm -hmm in yep. the most expensive zip code in the county. Yeah. They're sli I'm in rent control, I'm not saying that. <laughs> but, um, but they're sleeping, there are literally five people I know are sleeping in my alley mm -hmm. and every single night. And also, we kind of create this uh, chronically homeless epidemic, which ends up occurring mm -hmm. because, you know, we're not being proactive with dealing with people. And, you know, at the first stages that they need, like, for instance, myself, if I could have gotten, you know, su more support when I was still in my home, um, then before you know, putting me out in the streets and so forth, then that would have been a whole much better situation than, um, than all the stages that I then ended up going through that then only further exacerbated my state. I also want to just uh, say uh, veteran women are also, uh, there's a huge outcry and a need when it comes to veteran women because they're also part of the epidemic of, of folks who are ending up homeless. So I want to make sure I say that. Back row there. Hi, I'm a UCLA Anderson Business Center student, and I'm asking this question purely from a social impact perspective. Um, but is there any possibility in generating a positive investment return off of shelters or affordable housing solely to scale all the good work you guys are doing long term? Solely to what? To scale? To, to, scale, scale, to sustain scale. all the good work that you guys are currently doing and to kind of scale it on a. Mm -hmm. National level can, can this can supportive housing make more money and have more money and make money and have more money to spend later? Yeah, yeah. I think it can. I mean, there's people uh, playing around with social impact bonds, though they're not really bonds. <laughs> um, but there, but but there are other ways of of um, providing supportive housing that I think. Um, could utilize ex existing inventory, um, in which case you could build a business case, a business model for um, for a return to an investor. It's something that we have actually been exploring, and a few nonprofits have been exploring this. You know, um, but it requires an understanding as to what a return is, right? You know, you we're never going to give a 23% return. That just will never happen in supportive housing. However. 
is 7% acceptable, is 5% acceptable, is certainly more than you can get from, a, you know, from investments in your bank account, right? So, so I think it depends on the investor. And I think in some cases, that's why we still are looking for investors that are socially conscious, have a social mind, you know, um, because they would be willing to take three, five, seven percent. But you talk about some of the venture capital, I mean, some of the mortgage bankers I've been talking to, some of the investors still developing funds, they are looking at 22, 18 percent. And I just won't deliver that, unless I do it at scale. But we're not gonna do it at scale. <laughs> so. Front row. Uh, so you had mentioned uh, that if there was a way to like have stay in your house, if you would've got that help, that you need to stay over your roof. Mm -hmm. How do we, we, I think we all know the door is swinging faster opening into homelessness than it is swinging out. Sure. With all this money, it's great, but that money's not gonna really bring those numbers down because people are moving in faster than they're getting out. So how do we use all this stuff that we're talking about to address preventive services really and help people stay in their housing so that you don't lose your housing? Mm -hmm. um, because that's the problem right there. I mean, we yeah. need to stop the bleeding before we can mm -hmm. put it, you know. Right. I feel like yeah. we're just saying here's a Band-Aid to like, you know, put a little something mm -hmm. on it for right now, but how do we really address the issue at the forefront before it becomes an issue? Yeah, that, that's one of the things that, you know, we, we kind of struggle with is that, you know, uh, we can't control some of those factors that kind of, you know, contribute to people going to homelessness. Um, but in regards to prevention, we have two strategies. Um, our, our first original strategy had a, a homeless prevention strategy for families. And the reason why we only focused on families at first was because we didn't have any, we didn't have an ongoing funding stream, <laughs> you know? So uh, our board and a lot of the public prioritizes families with children on the streets. So. Um, we work with our county departments and uh, other agencies to kind of um, provide funding for them to kind of prevent homelessness within the family system. This past year, um, the, a new strategy was uh, approved with the passage of Measure H, and that's a homeless prevention strategy for individuals. And so, um, I guess the difficulty is, is because there's only a certain amount of money that we could allocate to those two strategies. And the challenge at this point while we're trying to develop the program and, and, and get it going is really identifying who really needs it. Because there's going to be people who are going to be, you know, evicted or kicked out of their homes or, you know, and they're going to figure it out. They're going to figure it out. They're going to find a place to stay. They're going to figure it out. They maybe they stay with a relative or maybe they'll move or maybe they'll change jobs or something. Um, but there's those people that we need to identify who if we don't help them, they are gonna be homeless. And so that's a difficulty, the difficult challenge I see with those strategies, um, but we're working through them and, and we're working with our partners at LASA and you know, community organizations to figure that out. I'd just like to say that's also then part of the myth and why they need people with lived experience at the table like myself, because um, I fought like hell. I fought like hell because I knew I had no one else to rely on. I knew. I had family. I had health. There were houses sitting empty. There were bedrooms and couches and floors sitting empty. But I was not welcome. Now, you want to understand this, why this is important? Because most of the demographic of folks who are ending up homeless here in, in L.A. are single folks, single middle-aged elderly folks. So, um, and, 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 they're, and, they're, and they do have to be get very intentional about... Um, finding measures and means beforehand. One is the economic development, and there was a young man earlier who asked about economic development. You know, where were the, um, the WIA, Workforce Investment Action Dollars and Programs, to offer um, um, em employment opportunities and trainings? Um, oh, I could go into stories that you all don't have time for right now. But uh, I'm just saying, because um, when, when, when and, and, I, and I have to speak up about that, because people get very, um, they, you know, get very filtered as far as they don't really understand how hard people fight not to end up. This was not something I was looking for. Mm -hmm. And people fight hard. And the harder I fought, the more that things just fell and kept falling and falling and falling through my fingers. And, um, and it's just really important to say that because people very much stigmatize again and stereotype who we are when you end up in poverty and when you end up in homeless. And also, this also then feeds back into why approximately uh, there's 9% of black folks here in LA County, yet 40% are living in poverty and homelessness. Let's go back to that. Let's go back to 25th uprising. 
where people were losing their homes and back in those days uh, and, and, and being uh, displaced from their communities back in those days when crack epidemic was being brought into the communities, when um, all the challenges that, that create people living in poverty, that create a demographic, that create black folks. Let's go back and talk about those instances and how those over year after year and decade after decade contribute to where we are now. Let's talk about those issues. Can I say also, to, in, in addition to those specific preservation strategies that Jerry mentioned, there's actually additional strategies that deal with systems change. And two of the big feeders into homelessness is the youth uh, coming out of um, foster care um, and the other is the criminal justice system. And there are huge networks right now, Groundswell in Los Angeles County, of organizations standing together to figure out how to address those changes to prevent the flow. Um, and those meetings are happening all the time because we're doing emails and such. Um, but changes do have to come from both local and from the state level um, to make sure that the flow gets stemmed. And, and this is what we call the systems change effort. And, and it is funded, in, there's some couple of places where it's funded in the, um, the 51 strategies. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and then domestic violence also is another yep. component. But, but the Tay and the criminal justice folks are getting the most traction right now. Yep. I just think it's important to, just as you mentioned, break it down by sectors. Not yeah. everyone's just homeless and just, right. that you need to break it down to veterans and young people and families and yep. foster care. There's so many different segments yep. and if we just keep on looking at it as just homelessness, yep. we're not going to get anywhere. Exactly. And I think that everyone needs to understand that right. yeah. and making sure that there's different segments and we need to right. address those segments right. all at the same time with a multi pronged approach. And if I could ask for one thing too is that to stop using the term the homeless, yeah. you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. We, you know I, that's when you hear me say people experiencing homelessness because yeah. they're all different kinds. Oh. I never say the homeless, I never say the population, and I never say the subpopulation either. I just got back from a women's, uh, black women's HIV AIDS uh, conference in, in Atlanta. And that's, you know, that's another demographic of epidemic of folks. Black, uh, black and brown women, especially black women. Um, and, and yet most of the dollars here in LA alone um, go to um, white male, uh, uh, white males. So even though there's an epidemic with uh, women of color, most of the resources and dollars are allocated to white uh, gay uh, males. Uh, when we know that we have an epidemic with women, um, and of HIV AIDS and so you know these are some of the things that we have to we have to call them out because we can't just say oh you know that person didn't try hard enough or that people get stigmatized and they get stereotyped and then uh, they just get discriminated against and then there's a system of people running um, running programs that are part of the whole issue of keeping those same demographic of people and that same um, that same uh, level of oppression thank you well, I'm very sorry. It's two o'clock. Um, I want to respect the time of our panelists, um, and you know, I want to thank them for their time once again. Um, you know, we'll hang around as long as we can for, for other questions. So come on up if you, if you need or want. Um, but again, please thank our, our panelists and thank you for coming. Thank you. Call out those elephants in the room. Come on. Yeah. Hey, sir. I wanted to make a comment.